Drink, oh, drink, oh, little star How oh, I wonder what you are Up above the world so high Like a diamond in the sky When the blazing sun is gone When there nothing shines upon then you show your little light We go drink all that Damn it! Our wing is here once more. If you've been watching my stuff these past few years, though I'm not sure why you would stay for this long, you'll remember that the last time I made an our wing video it was about psycho or crazy women in video games, which was like 3 years ago. It was a somewhat unique topic to tackle and I enjoyed making that video despite a few flaws here and there, so why not make another our wing video? This time being a bit more... personal. Every gamer... No wait, let me correct that. Everyone grew up with games, that's better, has had experiences that felt pretty terrifying when we were younger, maybe enough to the point of never touching a video game for weeks, but as we grow older we start realizing that most of the stuff that scared us as little kiddies don't really scare us anymore, in fact uh, sometimes they may be a little bit silly. And I'm no exception to this, which is why I decided for this Halloween I would share the 12 things in video games that scared the bejesus out of me as a little kid in no particular order this time around. Just remember this is solely based based on my own experiences as a kid, so of course some might come off as kinda embarrassing to be honest, but they really did scare real world me at one point in my childhood, so feel free to call me a weenie if you want, that's just how I honestly felt. With that out of the way, let's get this Halloween party started, shall we? For this video and I already feel super nostalgic thinking about it now. Legend of Zelda Wind Waker was the first Zelda game I played when I borrowed a GameCube from a friend of mine. I really loved playing it until the very end, I really liked how colorful it was and how awesome and immersive the music was, and I could relate to Toonwing's motivation to rescue his little sister being a big brother myself. I loved it so much that I was surprised by how much hate this game got at the time simply because it's not the Zelda game they wanted or some crap like that. But nowadays all the hate is it's pretty much gone. One of the reasons it got this much hate back then was because most of the haters believed it was a baby's game simply from the cel shaded art style, which honestly is just silly considering how there are some dark moments in the story and also THESE THINGS EXIST! Thought that we that from Ocarina of Time was scary with its zombie-like appearance and the piercing screech that literally paralyzes you, making you an easy target for their grotesque camping sessions? Well, these we deaths do that as well, except they work a hundred times more terrifying without they work less like zombies and more like Aztec demons with their big gaping mouths, glowing red eyes and that horrifying screech! <laughs> God damn it, these things killed me so much as a little kid, I'm pretty sure that the reason I forgot everything about the Earth Temple. I was even wondering why I don't remember much about the Earth Temple, despite being related to my favorite element, Earth. And then you get that one with best burp girl, Medley. And then I hear that petrifying scream and suddenly I remember why I repressed all the memories of the Earth Temple when I was younger. Nintendo really was traumatizing children, don't they? So I imagine younger me innocently playing a game like Wayman 2, going around defeating robot pirates, freeing fairies and teensies from cages throughout the game, when I come across a sick giant friend of Wayman named Quark who needs an elixir to cure his sickness and the only place where the elixir can be found is in this very lovely and totally family friendly place called the Cave of Bad Dreams. More childhood nightmares, yay! Okay, to be completely honest, despite the creepy aesthetic with the giant creepy ants sticking out the walls, the skulls you use as platforms, the purple toxic haze on the floor, and these little monsters popping up everywhere ready to roast you alive, weren't exactly scary to my younger self. And unsettledly, yeah, along with the creepy and mysterious sounding music, but got to the point of not wanting to play the game for a while, I still persevered with my good old friend Quark. But then I got here and... 
Now I know exactly why this place is called the Cave of Bad Dreams. The moment I stepped into this slide, that thing named Jano started chasing me and trying to eat me. What's worse is that throughout the entire chase scene, the camera looks like it's filming from inside Jano's mouth, meaning I could see his sharp teeth closing in on me as I slid down this path, giving me this feeling of dread and panic, as if Jano will eat me if I slow down even by a tiny bit, which of course ended up crapping a lot when I first went through this, and I'm pretty sure this gave me actual nightmares. Well, next time you get sick, please make sure to tell me a safer place for me to get a cure because otherwise... Also go get it anyways because I'm too friendly to leave you to die. Have you ever wondered if there's an alternate universe where Resident Evil was exactly the same but it replaced all the zombies and monsters with dinosaurs? Well, Capcom thought about the same thing and that's how Dino Crisis came into existence and then eventually fell into obscurity not long afterwards. I don't remember playing much of Dino Crisis 2 when I was younger, but I do remember that it was pretty much the first survival horror game I've ever played. Played a few minutes of it, and then never again. Why is that? Because of the dinosaurs, that's what. As a kid, I always thought dinosaurs were the coolest thing. But when they ambushed me out of nowhere, that's when I shat my pants and decided to never touch this game again. Doesn't help that the game has tank controls, and by that I mean you move somewhat slowly, all the while being forced to stop completely just to turn around and then move in a straight line. Controls seen mostly in survival horror games such as this one, and it's much more popular Big Brother, Resident Evil. It was mostly thanks to these that I died pretty quickly to these overgrown wizards. Since as a kid I've gotten so used to platformers with smooth and fluid controls that switching to the much stiffer tank controls threw me off the instant I started the game and... Yeah, that happened and I needed to change pants, but not before taking the disc out of the my PS1 and put it back in the shelf where it collected dust for almost two decades because I was too scared to ever touch the game again. And even if I wanted to go back there and kill those scary bastards for the shit they've pulled on my younger self, I'm pretty sure all of that dust it collected probably corrupted the game or something because it wouldn't play again no matter how many times I cleaned up the disc, so... Thanks for the nightmares, you dicks. Speaking of games with tank controls, let's talk about Tomb Raider, specifically the first game from the series I've played, Tomb Raider 2. I've already talked about Tomb Raider in the past, mostly about Lara Croft and how much of an iconic badass protagonist she is who, alongside Samus Aran, proved to the gaming world that women can be as strong as any other man. Most of my memories with Tomb Raider 2 involve just dicking around the Croft Manor where, unlike in Dino Crisis, I actually took the time to get used to the game's tank controls, climbing up walls, swimming on the water, walking the creepy stalking bottle in the freezer, and so I start the game at the Great Wall of China, feeling ready to raid some tombs, ha, and explore some ancient ruins and kill some bad guys, but all of a sudden I'm attacked by some random ass tiger who was just sitting there until I came down to explore. I was just standing there exploring the cave, seeing what kind of ancient treasure I could find, and then without any warning a tiger jumps down at me and starts taking large chunks of my health as I desperately try to shoot it down and I die. After that encounter, I was too scared to continue playing, knowing this wouldn't be the only time I'd be brutally ambushed like this, and like Dino Crisis, I never touched the game again. That target was just too much for younger me. Younger me was a massive wuss. At least I have almost every Tomb Raider game on Steam, so I can always come back and shoot that target for all the shit it pulled, but still, it traumatized me enough to never want to play any game that has tank controls at that time. Remember when licensed games had this reputation of being bad games only made to cash in on whatever source material they were basing the games on for the kiddies stupid enough to buy the games because they liked the source material? Yeah, that happened a lot back in the day and still happens nowadays, but not as much as it used to. And as kids, we still enjoyed it despite all of this. It's mostly because it was a game about a form of media we loved a lot until we grew older and realized it wasn't as good as we were better at being. But there are some exceptions that actually aged pretty well, like a bug's wife the video game. Despite the harsh critical reception it got, all I got to say is, 
Have I played completely different games or something? Because the Bugs Wife is actually really damn good. I don't get why people hate it so much. Some say it's because they gave up on level 2 because of its maze-like structure, but honestly it wasn't that bad. I was able to get through the level just fine as a little kid. What are you, a bunch of stupid babies? In fact, I completed level 2 and after facing Dumper, I got to level 4 and was rewarded with this peaceful and atmospheric view. This is what you missed out on, guys. And you can pick up a dandelion seed and glide across the desert. Isn't that just the best thing? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, no, no. Ah! Yeah, I think apology is in order. Right after I changed my pants, because what the flying fuck was that? I was happily enjoying gliding through the desert, and as soon as I get my foot on the ground, this gigantic ass bird swoops down and kills me instantly, scarring younger me enough to stop playing the game for weeks. It's one thing to be scared of dinosaurs and tigers, those are the type of animals capable of whipping a human body to pieces without much effort. This one's just a bird that's probably as big as my hand, but because I'm playing the game through the perspective of a tiny ant, the bird is like a terrifying Godzilla-sized monster ready to eat me as soon as I touch the ground. Seems we really that a tiny cute bird would cause me this much childhood trauma, but it honestly did. Of course I later came back and after a tedious run through the riverbed canyon, I managed to give a good old fuck you to that bird in the boss fight against it. Karma is a beautiful thing. Bye bye birdie! Now that we're done with Pixar games, let's work at a Pixar game. Wait, Toy Story 2 was once my favorite Pixar movie before Inside Out was a thing. So of course as a kid I just had to play the game based on the movie Toy Story 2 Action Game. A game that, just like a Bugs Life game, has aged pretty damn well despite being a game made for the Disney kiddies. The idea of exploring mundane working areas through the eyes of a living toy was a pretty cool concept and it's been done really well in this game. Heck, even the bosses and mini bosses are just toys that work somewhat intimidating but still pretty awesome. Like a a Zerg kite, an RC plane, a jackhammer, and a monster made out of toxic waste. Wait, what? I honestly didn't expect a game about a spaceman toy going on a journey to rescue his cowboy toy best friend from a fat disgusting nerd planning to sell him as a collector's item alongside all the toys from the same TV series he's from to have this demon offspring of the Blob and Oscar the Grouch. It even starts off in a dark alley in the middle of the thunderstorm with nothing but a trash can in front of me. So I decided to get a bit closer and... <coughs> Yeah, I was already scared out of my wit from its intimidating size and evil wrath, but the way it keeps jumping all over the place giving me almost no chance to aim and fire at it without getting hurt, and the fact that it throws homing snot balls at me was too much for younger me, but even worse is whenever I manage to shoot at it enough times to push it back inside the trash can, guess what? It just keeps coming back growing bigger and bigger every time, at that point I was so overwhelmed with fear that I stopped playing the game for weeks. It seems to be a recurring theme on this list. Things that made me stop playing the games because of how scary they were back then. But can you blame my younger self for being afraid of something like this? I'm just glad that I eventually managed to beat the slime monster and was rewarded with the best level in the game right afterwards. Because what kid wouldn't want to explore a toy store as an actual toy? I'd say that's a great reward to give to a kid after conquering their fears. Okay, this will be the last licensed game I'll talk about on this video, and it's one I'm sure you'll recognize. A real game called Sheepdog and Wolf. What? Y you never heard of this game? Well that's a shame, because it's a pretty amazing game that deserves more attention. Sheepdog and Wolf, or Sheep Raider as it's called in the US. But then that makes it sound like a porn parody of Tomb Raider where Warcraft Croft has a sheep fetish. It's a game where you play as Wally Coyote's almost an identical cousin, Ralph the Wolf, as he steals sheep without getting spotted by Sam the Sheepdog. Sounds pretty simple, right? Well, the way you steal the sheep without being caught becomes progressively harder and more complex as you advance through the game, and that's just half of it. The other half is getting the sheep to the goal by going through some platforming puzzle challenges. I remember that I used to read one of the many PlayStation magazines I collected when I was younger. Yeah, remember these? Back when the internet wasn't as easy and accessible as it is nowadays, these magazines was how I kept up to date with all the latest gaming news, and one of them had a walkthrough of Sheep Dog and Wolf that I always had near me in case I got stuck in some level. 
Well, actually the watch will only cover the first half of the game, while the other half was in the next issue, which I never got for whatever reason. So I was forced to go in the second half of the game completely blind, which means when I got to level 10, I wasn't prepared for the boss fight against Gossamer. Yeah, this big airy red monster didn't take being tricked into being chased by a weaving mad bull a couple of levels ago really well, but now he wants revenge, and because I went in blind this time, I had no clue how to beat him. At first I thought if I just placed the sheep on the button I'd get access to the rotating wheel and spin it to expose Gossamer to light which turned out to be his weakness, but every time I tried doing that Gossamer would just stop on the ground setting new chocolate that pushes the sheep into the lava, forcing me to start the boss fight all over again. After so many failed attempts I was so afraid of Gossamer that I was convinced that he was pretty much unbeatable and haven't touched the game for a long time. It was only when I got older that I figured out from a signpost that he gets dizzy very easily, which sounds a bit too vague for the end, but what it means is I had to literally run circles around him until he collapsed, giving me enough time to expose him to the light and finally beat him. Yeah, the boss fight turned out to be pretty simple and not that bad once I figured out what to do, but as a kid I never figured out how to beat this guy and that's why it scarred me for a while. And this is from a Looney Tunes game. Okay, since it is Halloween, I guess it's best to look at an actual Halloween themed game I played as a little kid, and luckily I got just the perfect game for it, Medieval 2. I've already talked about Medieval in the past, mostly about the undead protagonist Sir Daniel Fortescue and how it's pretty much what would happen if Tim Burton was in charge of making an entire video game series, which means there is a lot of stuff that could actually scare little kids like myself, stuff such as zombies, demons, dinosaur skeletons and vampires. But the one that actually traumatized me the most are… pumpkins. Yeah, pumpkins. But not just any pumpkins, these are mutated pumpkin monsters. When I reached the Kew Gardens, I had no issue facing these pumpkin monsters. Not only that, but I kept collecting these antidotes, which at the time I didn't know what it was for, but as soon as I got inside the greenhouse, everything started to make sense. And then I started to panic. You see, these antidotes are actually for keeping these poor innocent souls from turning into pumpkin monsters themselves soon after they've been bitten by one, but you have to give the antidote to them as quickly as possible, because otherwise they'll turn into pumpkin monsters and the antidote won't work on them anymore. And you actually lose showers points. So you can imagine how panicked and scared I was running around, trying to save all these unwilling victims all the while killing these pumpkin monsters before they make things worse. But most of the time I ended up being too late again and again because all the stress and panic messed me up and from that point I just gave up and haven't played the game since. I felt terrible that I couldn't save everyone from those pumpkin bastards and this concept out of how these poor souls go through the transformation from human to pumpkin monster didn't help matters. Nowadays my copy made Medieval 2 is broken, so I can go back to it even if it is just to feel nostalgic. But I did get the first one though. That's something. Now I get to talk about one of my favorite gaming series, Spyro the Dragon. As a kid, if I was ever in a mood to play a platformer that isn't Crash Bandicoot, then Spyro was the next best thing. I always enjoyed going around collecting items and burning up enemies as everyone's favorite purple dragon. I can't wait for when the Reignited Trilogy comes out so that I can re-experience it all over again. Though, despite Spyro being a platformer for kids, there were still a lot of scary things in the games. Stuff like the dog monsters in Spyro 1. One, the robot sharks in Spiral 2, and also all of the bosses in Spiral 3, particularly the third boss, Scorch. Even before we face this monstrosity, it's been built up in the cutscene playing before his boss fight as the monster to end all monsters. And honestly, he whipped up to that title when I faced him as a child. If you thought that Scorch working like an unholy fusion between a dragon and a bat was scary enough, then know about the fact that he spits giant eggs scaring all sorts of enemies, including crabs, suicide bombs, weasels, waving fireballs that chase you until they explode, and even boss, the first boss of the game, gets thrown in to make your life a living nightmare. It sure did mine, cause I always ended 
ended up getting sworn by his underwings more than trying to get a hit on an abomination. Normally I wouldn't be this intimidated by all of this, but the music actually made it sound way more horrifying for my younger self. It's as if the music was saying, Hey kids, you're gonna fucking die! I also need to mention that you find Scorch inside a rotting royal corpse. Waited E for everyone? More like waited CT for childhood drama. Nowadays Scorch is piss easy, I can take him down without any problem. But back then as a kid, I was terrified of this monster. Makes me wonder if he can look any scarier than he already is. Guess I'll have to wait for the reignited trilogy to find out. Even though I'm not sure if I'm ready for it. Enough to the gay shit. I want a game for big boys. Something that's dark and edgy and has guns, boobies and mild cursing. Perfect! In all seriousness, I loved playing Jack 2 a lot as a little kid. Despite its very frustrating moments at times, it was pretty clear that Naughty Dog wanted to go for a darker, more cinematic storytelling perspective. Which is made apparent at the very beginning where Jack and his friends open up the time portal they found in the secret ending of the first game. And this is the first thing they witness! Yep, 5 minutes in and I was already freaked out by that. He didn't really show up much after that, but for whatever reason, I could feel his presence somehow. As if he was watching my every move. Like everything I was doing was all part of his master plan. Like a pawn in his chess game. I kept wondering when would I meet that monster again. That feeling of paranoia was always there. Oh hey Corb, how you doing? Have you found out there with good old Baron or something? I'm sure you Deep down in your darkest nightmares. We've met before, remember? Everything's going exactly as planned. <laughs> Jack! It's the Metalhead leader! Now you see. Without the shield wall disrupting my powers inside the city, I am my full potential now. So for the last time, give me the precursor stone! Yeah, this innocent looking old man who's been helping Jack in his quest for revenge against Bill and Praxis, this guy who's been looking after this little kid because he's the successor to the throne, turned out to be the leader of the monstrous metalheads that invaded Jack's world and turned it into the dystopian future that Jack and his friends got themselves stuck in, in the first place. This twist pretty much caught me so off guard that I had to wash my pants before recovering my jaw that just dropped at the sight of this ugly ass beast. And of course I had to go and face him. And this battle only scarred me further from how hard it was as I kept dying over and over again. But once I beat him, man that felt so satisfying. It feels great to conquer your own fears, doesn't it kids? We go from one Naughty Dog game to another Naughty Dog game. This time it's the first video game I remember ever playing in my childhood, Crash Bandicoot 2. I hold a lot of precious childhood memories for this game, from overcoming the many platforming challenges to the somewhat memorable bosses to jumping on the poor bear cub to get a lot of extra lives. Animal cruelty at its finest. Needless to say, the game has aged pretty damn well, even when the Yang Saint trilogy exists. But we're here to talk about things that's called me for life, aren't we? So I went into this level called Unbearable, and when I arrived, I quickly noticed how Crash is facing to the camera, so I naturally assumed this was just another boulder level. So I went through it as I usually do, and... Ah! What the actual fuck is that?! As soon as that giant polar bear started chasing me, I was overwhelmed with fear and panic. I kept running as fast as I could, but then that bastard of a bear would always kill me and then laugh at my misery, with that sadistic grin on his face. It was all too much for me, it scared me so bad that whenever I played Crash 2, I always had my dad do this one level for me while I was hiding behind a wall, because that bear was too scary for my younger self. It took years until I finally had the courage to do the level all by myself. That and the fact that he's a boss in Crash Bash helped me get over over this traumatic event in my childhood. And in the insane trilogy, he's almost as terrifying as I remember, except when I die, his life isn't exactly that evil anymore, and it's more like, <laughs> 
At least maybe some kids born in the current generation will now know the pain I went through. So we've come to this. I know I said at the beginning of this video that this list was in no particular order, but I made sure to save this one for last. Because while these past 11 entries all used to scare me a lot as a kid, the key word is used to. Because as a grown adult in my mid 20s, these don't scare me that much anymore. But this last entry is something that even as a grown up I feel to this day. It comes from my favorite video game series ever, Pokemon. Specifically, Mystery Dungeon. When it comes to Mystery Dungeon and things that scarred fans for life, people usually jump to two contenders. The Monster Houses, which consist in being suddenly sworn by worlds of enemy Pokemon entirely at random. And also Kekuyan's shop, where Kekuyan becomes your worst nightmare if you even think about stealing his shit. But my pick is none of these. Monster Houses were just pretty annoying to me. And as for Kekuyan, I always prayed for his stuff like a good boy. My pick comes from the first Mystery Dungeon game, Red the Blue Rescue Team. At one point the protagonist, a human who mysteriously turned into a Pokemon, meets Zatu, a Pokemon known for looking into the future, who tells them that them being turned into a Pokemon and the sun and rise are natural disasters all linked in some way, and that there's a big chance that it could lead to the end of the world. Such a dark and gloomy revelation. It would be a shame if a certain trickster of a ghost type happened to listen to the entire conversation and told everyone in the Pokemon Square about it, leading to every single Pokemon turning onto the protagonist and planning on killing them in a desperate attempt to put the world's balance in order. Oh wait, it did happen and the experience pretty much scarred me for life! To think all of these Pokemon were once my friends that you could have a friendly chat with, made my stay in Pokemon Square feel welcoming and accepting, just suddenly turned on me and tried to kill me simply because I exist. Because they believe that as long as I'm alive, their world is gonna be destroyed. And to make matters worse, I get told that every rescue team out there has made killing me their top priority, and anyone who helps me is to meet the same fate. This why they destroyed me, because this is pretty much my worst fear come true. Isolation. The fact that besides my partner Pokemon, no one is coming to my aid. Everyone has abandoned me. Simply want me gone. Because some purple twat told everyone that I'm the reason their world is in an ever growing chaotic mess. I couldn't defend myself out of sheer panic. It just simply froze up as everyone decided the world was better off if I never existed. This is something that scared me so much as a kid going through the hell that was middle school. And it still really scares me as an adult. Especially when nowadays I keep seeing false accusations being thrown around almost every day on the internet. And I've seen the kind of damage this does to the falsely accused. It scares me how anyone can just point fingers at other people and falsely accuse them of something they've never done. And watch as their personal lives turn into a living nightmare. It scares me because... What if this shit happens to me? What if someone accuses me of something horrible they claim I've done? What if all my friends and family just turn on me and cut me out of their wives? I know I'm just probably exaggerating, but that's honestly how I feel. Seeing this happen to me in a video game where this cute little mouse is the main mascot, I just never expected it would traumatize me this much even as I've grown older. This fear of isolation never went away. And that's why I saved this one scary moment in video games for my childhood for last. I'm the Army Slayer and sorry for getting a bit too personal back there. I guess I had to get those feelings off my chest. But thanks for listening to what I had to say. What are some things in games that scared you guys when we were children? I'd love to see what you have to say in the comments section below. And until then, happy Halloween everybody and see you guys next time.